Okay, everyone, welcome to the Respect the Math podcast brought to you by Reliable Tech Help. For all your IT needs, call Reliable Tech Help at 502-797-7399 or visit our website at ReliableTechHelp.com. That's ReliableTechTekHelp.com. I'm your host, Digital David Snyder. Here at the Respect the Math podcast, we talk about everything from technology to business, science, popular culture, and more. Basically, the things that I'm interested in because I'm kind of selfish that way. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and podcast apps from Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, and others. Please interact with us online. And if you like what you hear, please subscribe to and share our content. We'd love to hear from you. Today, our guest is Sean Dolly. He's president of OT2 Consulting. They work in leadership development. Welcome. For, welcome. Thank you for being here. Hey, great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, sir. And tell us uh, more about what you do, Sean. We help leaders uh, at all levels across all sectors and any type of a company or organizational environment develop their emotional intelligence. Now that phrase has some buzzword baggage to it, but in essence, what we do is help people at a very, very basic level understand some of the neuroanatomical principles, the physiology, some degree of cognitive psychology that we all have going on within us, especially as leaders when we are under stress, under duress, when we're pressed for time, because as a general rule, the things that require the best of us as leaders have a funny way of bringing out our worst. So we help leaders uh, acknowledge what those things are. I'm not a neuroscientist. I don't have an advanced degree in neuropsychology, but after collecting a lifetime of bad leadership experiences, I was able to reflect upon that. And when yeah. I looked back and looked for some common themes, I realized, you know, it wasn't because I wasn't the dumbest guy or smartest guy in the room. It wasn't because I'm an introvert or an extrovert. Typically, in those instances where I failed or in those few times where I succeeded, uh, most of it hinged on, again, what I would call uh, our emotional intelligence, the ability to recognize what's going on within myself and then choosing rather than reacting to be more deliberate in responding. Yeah, and let's talk about those experiences. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for your service. You served how long in what branch of the military? 25 years. I joined active duty right out of high school at 17, which meant that I had to get my uh, mom's uh, permission. Yeah. <laughs> Um, was that hard or was she, was she ready to push you out the door? <laughs> um, you know, fast forward a few years later when I was uh, going through survival school and one of the many things that you do when you're in that, um, you know, luxurious, uh, all inclusive yeah. is learn how to um, get out of some harsh interrogation techniques. And yeah. it was easier surviving the harsh interrogation tactics of my uh, makeshift captors uh, than sitting through a grueling session with my mom as a 17 year old yeah. uh, who's trying to convince me that that might not be the right thing to do. But to her credit, um, she knew and agreed with me that I was not nearly mature enough uh, to probably go off to college on my own. That would have mm -hmm. been a disaster. And I think she saw the value in the structure of joining the military. And, and thankfully um, I did that structure worked very well for me. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that that's how I got in, you know, mom had to sign on the dotted line. And, you know, fast forward, I'm in boot camp as a 17 year old, uh, you know, bright eyed, bushy tail recruit. Yeah, quite possibly the ultimate in leadership training, right? The military? You know, absolutely. And uh, I would absolutely say that uh, the military does not have a monopoly on leadership. Uh, Good and bad leaders are found in all walks of life. There are great leaders who exercise leadership at their local homeowner association. Uh, there are great leaders who exercise leadership um, as a t-ball coach, uh, yeah. as a police chief, as a Fortune 100 CEO. So uh, in no way do I think that, well, because I was in the military, uh, I've cornered the market on leadership experiences. I, I learned plenty watching good and bad shift managers as a 16-year-old at McDonald's yeah. as an employee, uh, just like I learned great leadership lessons and some things not to do from some generals, you know, that I worked under during my time in the Air Force. Yeah, you strike me as a person who's very um, self-aware. Not, not only are you aware of yourself, but you're always observing the people around you, the environment, the situation. Is that part of your nature and or was it kind of influenced or enhanced by the military training or did you just pick that up in the military? What's that, um, what's that look like? So, uh, but great, great question. I appreciate that. So um, 
I, like you and everyone else, at the moment we're in now, are the sum total of our life experiences. By nature, I am very outwardly observant. I'm the guy that sits in the corner of the room and assesses, you know, the landscape, the people coming, the people going, the people that are interacting. Again, by nature. By nature, not self-aware. Okay. Not self-aware. Tying it back to, uh, I think, my opening remarks where I talked about, you know, being self-aware, understanding what's going on inside of me. Uh, Usually, early in my leadership journey, I was maybe the last person to know uh, how I was feeling, yeah. what I was thinking, how I was physiologically responding. And a, uh, a, a young man, that term is relative, right? <laughs> As I'm getting older, everybody seems younger, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, he he, some great feedback. He did not know he was giving me great feedback once. He said, um, just kind of casually, he goes, yeah, it's usually pretty obvious when you're, and I'll use the word upset. Yeah. Not his choice of word, but he's, yeah, it's usually pretty obvious when you're upset. And he, he didn't necessarily mean anything by it other than a just a generic observation. Yeah. Um, but I thought, you know, in a leadership capacity, just like that old adage, you know, when mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Mm-hmm. How we project ourselves in the workplace has such a palpable effect on the vibe within the building, within the tribe, within the organization. Uh, as a general rule it's harder for a team to be more hopeful or optimistic than the level or the ceiling that the leader has set. Sure. And so to wrap it up, by nature, very outwardly observant. Only by nurture have I learned and forced myself to be much more uh, proactive yeah. in stopping, calling a timeout on myself. Okay, look, you're irritated about something. Yeah. What is that? Okay, now that I know what it is, well, why is that? You know, yeah. peel the onion back. Why is this really perturbing me? Uh, that has been a work in progress, but because I know that it is a skill that can be developed, it's central to how I help my clients now. It sounded like that one observation that person made back then really impacted you. It made you kind of redirect some of that outward awareness toward inward, right? To start reflecting on yourself, it, and it did uh, on two levels. One, just the the specific targeted feedback that he gave me uh, caused me to to pause and think, okay, this is somebody with whom I have relatively infrequent interaction. And to his credit, he felt comfortable enough to share that. Again, yeah. not in an accusatory way, yeah. but just he offered it up casually. Uh, and he, he read your mail. <laughs> he, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it, it helped in that regard. But then the other lesson, you know, the, the, the sort of secondary, but maybe even more important lesson, was that, you know, when you are at the bottom of the totem pole, you can't help but get feedback. You know, when you are the rookie in an Air Force flight squadron, or once upon a time, when you're the most recent hire at the McDonald's, uh, people will tell you how you're doing, what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. As an unfortunate but unavoidable paradox, the higher you climb in any organization, whether it's a Fortune 500 company, uh, the Department of the Navy, or uh, the local uh, you know, moose lodge to which you res- uh, belong, mm-hmm. the less likely you are to get that feedback. And who needs feedback more than the boss, yeah. right? Because he or she is the person that has uh, undoubtedly the biggest emotional impact on the organization. And yet, unfortunately, uh, he or she is typically least likely to get that feedback, which makes it imperative um, that we in positions of leadership can do that to ourselves. Yeah. And this is the kind of self-awareness, the kind of um, taking a personal inventory inventory that you bring to your business and OT2 Consulting, hu- helping um, business owners and leaders in all types of different uh, positions do that for themselves, be a, a set a better example for their, their team members, and also be uh, better leaders, correct? Yeah, and and I appreciate you kind of opening up the aperture on the radar, so to speak. Uh, somebody may be listening and thinking, okay, I, I run a small business in the retail sector. What possibly could we learn from a former uh, military commander, Air Force, Air National Guard pilot who flew combat sorties? I get it, right? But 
when I went into the corporate world uh, as a director or as a vice president, what I found was once you strip away the vernacular that's peculiar to a given role at a given company in a given industry, much of the leadership opportunities and challenges with which we're confronted are relatively universal. They vary by magnitude, mm -hmm. right? You know, the CEO of GM has has a different degree of leadership challenges than the overnight uh, shift supervisor who runs all of the janitorial services. Mm -hmm. All jobs are important. We would just say that there's probably different degrees, different magnitudes of intensity. But it's the same basic phenomena with which you're confronted. Culture shaping, team building, planning, execution, having difficult conversations, resolving conflict. I mean, at this core, you, you back out the lexicon that seems idiosyncratic to a particular role, and you find that, in general, leadership is leadership is leadership. Mm -hmm. And through, again, some very hard-fought uh, lessons learned, because we tend to learn more from our mistakes when we are observant, mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like uh, I'm in a great place now to you know share some of those, uh, hey, don't do this uh, approaches to leadership. And every once in a while, I might have actually got something right. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple layers going on here. You, you kind of glazed over your military service, but I want to talk about that for a minute. Um, I have so much respect for the military first responders, everybody who risked their lives and put their family and their well-being at risk to protect us. You know, I just I want to get that out there. So I have so much um, gratitude and respect for anybody who serves in, in any of those capacities. You worked your way up to being, was it a captain in the Air Force as a pilot? I was a lieutenant colonel, lieutenant uh, colonel. in the Air Force and Air National Guard. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And um, like we said earlier, that's kind of leadership 101. You're not going to hang around in the military for that long if you don't, you don't learn how to be set, set a good example for other people, but also have discipline and self-awareness, correct? Sure. Uh, you know, to some degree, there is a relatively formulaic path that uh, whether you are enlisted or part of the officer corps that your, your career kind of progresses at. Uh, so, you know... It's, it's not simply about making rank, uh, but within uh, a group of relatively homogenous um, associates, team members, employees, uh, some are kind of plucked out for leadership roles, right? So, you know, you might have a basketball team with 13 players on the roster, but one team captain, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I certainly um, was fortunate that for some reason, um, as a relatively young officer, I was uh, blessed to be under the tutelage and wing of some uh, really great leaders, uh, some, some men and women who I really admired. And they saw something in me and uh, put me in positions where I could sink or swim. Uh, I apparently tread water well enough yeah. uh, in the early go that I got more responsibility. So yeah. um, it, was, it, it was an interesting ride. Um, at the same time, on one side of the fence, looking over at the greener grass, I thought I would love to be, I'd love to be, you know, that guy. I'd love to be that gal. That's who I want to be. And then when given those opportunities and you are confronted with a decision where there is no good option here, like it, it, it at best, I'm going to disappoint half of these people. Yeah. Uh, you suddenly realize that, you know, loneliness can be the price of leadership, uh, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't have had it any other way. And, and again, I, I can't help uh, but uh, say it one more time that I was very fortunate because most leaders still have leaders. I don't know at what point you get to when you don't answer to somebody. Right. So I was always fortunate that uh, because the nature of my leadership tends to be a, a, a tad, you know, lean forward, hard charging. Um, I was always very blessed to have people over me that provided some, what we call top cover Yeah. Uh, that um, made sure that so long as I was doing things morally, legally, ethically, uh, they provided a hedge of protection around me so I could, you know, make my own mistakes, learn my own lessons and get better as I went. Yeah. You mentioned, um, we learned from our mistakes. I like to say that losers are people that don't learn from their mistakes, right? Yeah. Uh, or, or yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would, basically take that same comment and uh, I twisted it a bit for myself as I was coming up to the ranks and my goal was to always make a new mistake. Yeah. My goal was always, all right, look, <laughs> okay. Yesterday I invented four different ways to not do that. Right. Can today I at least be innovative? You know, don't make one of those mistakes again. Um, because it's good 
when we can learn from our own mistakes. It's great when we can learn from somebody else's. Yeah. And, um, and I wish on the front end I had the crystal ball where I always knew where to zig, vice zag, didn't. Uh, but to your point, um, by not quitting, by not giving up, by not losing the battle, um, at least came up with novel ways uh, to mess things up so that I wasn't repeating some of the same old uh, stuff that had got me in trouble before. Yeah, I love little sayings that have little kernels of wisdom in them. And one of them was... Uh, um, Smart people learn from their mistakes. Wise people learn from the mistakes of others. That really kind of hits home with me. And then another one, when we're talking about leadership here, um, you can't push a rope. Have you heard that one? I have. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you've got to set an example. You've got to pull people in the direction of that goal and not try to push them in that that direction. So Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about your corporate experience because we touched on your military experience. What did you bring from your corporate or from your military experience to your corporate experience and how did that kind of um, shape the vision you have today for OT, OT2 consulting? As I mentioned earlier, it's, it, it takes some deliberate effort, at least on my part, uh, when you are plucked out of one environment and then set down in another to not consistently try to uh, play the compare and contrast game. You know, what mm. is the same? What is different? Uh, because if you are, especially like the transition I made, which was pretty, it was pretty radical. I went from one environment to one that was seemingly, and in many ways, uh, tangibly, you know, quite different. Yeah. I was able, and it took a while, it took a while for me to figure this out, that at the end of the day, our organizations are not defined by the building in which we reside. It's not defined by the organizational chart. It's not defined by the macro or micro processes that we use to take some kind of an input and provide some kind of good or service on the other end. It is defined by the people that are there at that moment. Now, in any organization, people will come, people will go, but at any given point in time, the organization is the people. Like if I asked you to tell me about your family growing up, you probably wouldn't tell me first, oh, our address was... Okay. Or this yeah. was our family car or uh, my family. Oh, we used to go to Florida on vacation. You would probably just tell me who the people were. Yeah. And in a very fast paced and at times transactional world in which we live, which we need not apologize for. You know, if, if somebody is the owner of a company, they are obligated to pay somebody who shows up for work, and that person is obligated to provide production. So there is some transactional nature Mm -hmm. to any employer-employee relationship. Totally get it. But what I found was, if we can get beyond that, the same leadership principles that served me well in the military found utility in the corporate world. Mm -hmm. They would in the nonprofit world. They, they, They would in the household. In that, okay, Right now, you are wearing a uniform or you have a company ID badge or you have an organizational email inbox that kind of defines you as a worker, as a team member, as an associate. But behind all that, you're just a person. Mm -hmm. And you were a person important to other people before you got here. You'll be a person important to other people when you leave. Therefore, how do I relate to you as a person without overstepping any bounds while being delicately sensitive to you know, HR protocols and those things that are important that that we must have. But if we can get to a point where the person whom I'm leading truly believes that I authentically care about them simply for who they are, not simply for what they bring to the company each day, then even if my motives are altruistic, at some point in the future, when I need them to run through a brick wall, they're probably more inclined to do it Yeah, because they're thinking, okay, He didn't need to do this, say this, act a certain way, but he did. I feel like we've bonded on a level that maybe transcends that, again, what I'll use the word, transactional nature Mm -hmm. of a, you know, boss, uh, follower, you know, relationship. And so what I found was that even though I picked those skills up in the military, sometimes the hard way, um, universally applicable. Yeah. And if I were to ask you, okay, well, who was your favorite teacher, who was your favorite high school guidance counselor, who was your favorite coach, you might lead with, well, this guy because he won an award, or this guy because he was the smartest, or this woman because she was most popular. More likely, 
your favorite coach, your favorite teacher, your favorite boss, you're going to tell me about their empathy, their compassion, their ability to meet you where you were at that moment Mm -hmm. and then bring you up from there. Connect with you. Yeah, that's right. Because leadership precedes MBAs, logisticians, credentials. Uh, That's right. That's right. Uh, Once upon a time, our ancestors were in a tribal environment in which, you know, our hunter gatherers uh, were being led by somebody. Yeah. You know, who was the matriarch of that clan, right? And so leadership is, is, is fundamental to the human experience. Mm. And sometimes in the corporate world, in the military environment, in anything that has a lot of structure and bureaucracy informing it, I think we kind of forget that. We yeah. forget that at the end of the day, leading is all about influencing. And that is a very human phenomenon. Yeah. And besides the obvious things you learned in your professional experience in the military and the corporate world, those things would be integrity, discipline, um, you know, self-awareness, that kind of thing. I think what makes you unique is you can actually analyze this from the psychological and the neurological standpoint, correct? Can you talk talk about how that makes you unique in the space? There's a lot of people out there motivating people, teaching people how to be good leaders, right? right? Yeah. But you, I think you have a unique yeah, yeah, angle yeah. on that. Can yeah. you talk, can you talk uh, about so, that? So uh, when, I, when I shared with some close friends uh, from my, you know, aviator days, uh, what I was maybe going to embark on, you know, they couldn't help but make the uh, comparisons to the old Chris Farley, you know, Matt Foley oh, character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Band down the, the river. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, we get plenty of that, you know, yeah. uh, uh, social media is the worst, right? We're bombarded with these like fortune cookie level philosophies all day long, mm-hmm. right? Uh, people don't need that. That, that's, that, you know, there's nothing wrong with an inherently wise saying as being somewhat of like a, a North Star. But at the end of the day, um, motivation is fleeting. Education, you know, endures. And so I cannot set the bar low enough. Again, I am not a trained neuroscientist. You know, my, my, my master's in political science, that's not science. <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> so um, I, I'm very careful to say that if you want to be educated in cognitive psychology, I would encourage you to go seek out a licensed clinician or an academic researcher. If you want uh, some really deep knowledge about um, our endocrine or chemical, you know, physiology, uh, there's endocrinologists, you know, that can help you with that. Yeah. I'm a leader who helps leaders be better versions of themselves. I do that by acknowledging and lightly touching on some of those things. So, we feel before we think. And unfortunately, uh, what is called our sympathetic nervous system is a division of what's called the autonomic nervous system. Auto being is, it happens without your vote. Is the same one that your great, 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 great grandfather used to his benefit to outrun for at least five seconds, that saber tooth. Survive in a primitive environment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we have what is known as a fight or flight response or acute stress response magnificently designed for physical threats. Yeah. For physical threats. So it when I was... It put us at the top of the food chain, right? I'm sorry? It put us at the top of the food chain along with other it, things. It, yeah. And on the days we weren't at the top, it at least avoided us from being consumed on a... Yeah. subsidiary tier, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, so we have an we have an intrinsic central nervous system apparatus that you know, without the use of props and visuals, uh, what we talk about in the course curriculum, and again, in a very relatable way. You know, I'm I'm just a knuckle dragon recovering pilot, right? <laughs> but what we talk about is how we've got a pair of what are called amygdala in each left and right hemisphere of our brain, part of what is called our limbic system, that are threat radars on constant alert. And as soon as they even perceive a threat, real or not, Mm -hmm. they go warning, 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 and they trigger a cascade of chemical physiological reactions that end up pumping what's called norepinephrine into various target organs. And when I was a fifth grade student walking to the front of the class to give a speech, when I was a newly minted combat aviator flying a sortie in a war zone for the first time, when I was a brand new commander about to give some bad news to a room full of type A alphas, increased heart rate, shallow breathing, 
increased heartbeat, shallow breathing, increased heartbeat, shallow breathing. It's the same physiological phenomena. So while we might occasionally experience a physical threat, you know, you're out for a jog and a dog starts chasing you. Most of our threats, and I'm using that term broadly, are social. They're a lot more nuanced. They tend to be more complex. And yet we're only equipped with one sympathetic nervous system. Mm. So we cannot install an on-off switch. I've tried. (laughs) And that old John Wayne approach, just rub some dirt on it. Uh, No, 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 no. I, I do not apologize for acknowledging that when I'm, uh, you know, inbound to an objective area on NVGs, you know, about to put a airdrop payload onto a target in southern Afghanistan that I was uh, a bit amped up. Right. I'm not apologizing for right. that. Right? Yeah. The question is, can we install a rheostat such that we can't eliminate the stress? Yeah. And I don't think we would really want to, but can we at least dial down the intensity such that we can then engage the other part of our brain, the prefrontal yeah. cortex, where we do that advanced thinking, that logical planning, that future-oriented uh, endeavoring, uh, mm. the impulse control. Mm-hmm. That's the whole goal. So what we help people with in the training, in the keynotes, in the classroom seminars, is not turning them into Vulcans, right? Not turning them into creatures void of emotion, not trying to suppress their emotion, but rather, A, acknowledging it, B, understanding that it's completely normal. Mm -hmm. That is a normal human physiological response. But C, helping them understand how they can possibly mitigate it so as to make better, logical, informed decisions. Yeah, so A, get some awareness of it that it's happening. And then B, learn how to dial it back to that level where it's most efficient and it's not overcoming your other vital senses and instincts and all that stuff that'll help to help you stay alive and make the best decisions. Correct. That's, that's right. Because uh, I think I mentioned earlier that as a leader, when something falls into your lap and if you have structured your organization correctly, you only get the tough problems, right? If a problem is binary and it had a pretty simple yes or no response and it got to you, you need to probably rework, you know, organizational communication because somebody else probably should have got that before mm-hmm. you got it. Yeah. So when you get a problem as a leader, if it is really dialing up the intensity of your emotional response, it probably is something important and therefore requires you to be at your best. Yeah. And yet, and yet uh, it likely might be, automatically bringing out your worst because that physiological response that's triggered, you know, that acute stress response uh, that happens without your input yeah. and, and it gets well on its way before you even stop and think, wait a minute, is this really that big of a deal? Yeah. And it could be too late once you do that. Right. And, and it's really hard. It is really hard to be at your intellectual peak when you are in a heightened emotional state. And, and, and I can tell you how many times I wish I knew after the fact, I could reflect where I did something, said something, and I thought, I cannot believe I did that. Yeah. In the heat of the moment, I cannot, oh my goodness, that seems so obvious. Why did I do that? Well, again, I'm a human being, and I'm not apologizing for being human. I'm just trying to be a better version <laughs> of myself. Yeah. Um, OT2 Consulting stands for On Time and On Target, correct? That's right. Uh, can you explain the significance behind the name there? I'm sure those are military terms. They are. And, uh, you know, again, just like we don't have a monopoly on leadership, we're not the only people uh, in given professions that want to be on time and on target. But as a uh, as an Air Force aviator, the the mission upon which we typically embarked would usually involve at the pinnacle of what we're being called to do, uh, putting an, an airdrop airload payload onto a set of coordinates or a piece of turf within a very explicit time frame. Yeah. So from the moment somebody would come into the tent when I'm on alert status and say, hey, dude, you're alerted. From that moment until we get to that point in space where we hit the green light and send it you know, out the door, everything needs to be tailored and focused towards getting that plane in the right piece of three-dimensional real estate at the right time. Yeah. So... Are we talking a second or two margin or a minute or two or sometimes? Uh, Sometimes you might have a pretty wide window. 
if it's a routine resupply and you are dropping in a permissive environment, it's basically Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm being a tad facetious because yeah. you have to deconflict airspace, and especially in crowded battle space like in, like say, over the skies of Afghanistan or Iraq, yeah. uh, you can't be freewheeling around up there. The last thing you want to do is trade paint with another coalition aircraft, right? And some of this was it during combat in Afghanistan and Iraq also, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, it, it, extremely elaborate matriculation system was set in place long before I showed up yeah. to pilot training that helped guide me to that point where I was uh, effectively proficient to do that. You know, like there was people holding my hand for a long time to get me to that point where they can give me the keys to uh, an aircraft and I could lead a crew to a point where we can say, all right, we hit the TOT, the time on target, and the payload landed within an acceptable distance of the point of impact. Okay, that sortie was on time. It was on target. Everything else has to back up from that. So from the time the guy wakes me up in the tent until we grab our pre-flight meal, we go into the intel uh, vault to get briefed up. We go through the tactics to understand, you know, what the uh, course of action is going to be for the route. Everything has to finally funnel to that point where you're in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And then backing it up one layer as a commander. Okay, what are you doing to set the table, so to speak, within the organization so that all of those trained men and women, when they're given the keys, are equipped, are ready, are able, are capable, so that they can execute missions on time on target. Yeah. So it was a bit of a shift going from being the quarterback to being the coach. Mm. Uh, it took a little bit of a transition because you like, I want to be on the field, you know. And, and yeah. even as a commander, you still flew, you know. But, but at that point... Flying sorties became secondary to leading an organization flying sorties. And and yet, and yet, I kept that same ethos. Everything I did as a commander needed to set conditions such that when asked to do so, the men and women under my care uh, were best equipped and best ready um, to be themselves on time and on target. Yeah, and so from your experience in leadership and uh, the military and the corporate world, when you... Uh, consult with a company or, or an individual client. Is that typically at a seminar level? Do you offer individual consulting with people? W what does that look like? There's a spectrum of options by which we can help clients. And it could be a company, it could be a nonprofit, it could be a federal agency, it could be a municipality. It can be anything from a one-off keynote at their annual awards banquet at the other end, it could be a full two-day course where we not only get into the basics of that neuropsychology, physiology, uh, we also then will get into uh, specific leadership challenges. Okay, so now that you have this baseline understanding, how do you leverage that to improve your emotional intelligence across a handful of composites and then take that information and specifically apply it to challenges germane to your organization at that time? Mm -hmm. It could be intergenerational leadership. It could be leading virtual teams, but we take the core information and then apply it so that there are very, very explicit, actionable takeaways. We are too busy and budgets are too tight for me to come into a company and for a person with budgetary or decision-making authority say, yeah, I would love to have 40 of my directors sit in a room uh, for two hours or two days and uh, be wowed with entertaining gee whiz. Mm -hmm. If there's no ROI, they shouldn't do it. We're not prepping people uh, uh, for trivial pursuit. You know, we're prepping them to be immediately more effective at influencing and inspiring their teams. So at one end, we can do two-day classes. At the other, in a classroom environment, we can do two-hour seminars. It's the same core material that forms the foundation for those two or anything in between the amount of time that we have with their leaders determines the depths to which we can plumb and the uh, amount of time we can spend on specifically applicable um, avenues that they can take it and put it into work that day. Let's talk about the people you want to have a conversation with to get this ball rolling. Obviously, decision makers, business owners. Uh, what are some other examples of introductions you'd like to get, get to people to offer them your services? If you have people that are brand new leaders 
or you have identified some individuals that are individual contributors, but you think probably should be leading others because of how well they function at their given task, and you see some managerial upside in them. If you have mid-level leaders who've maybe been leading for a while and maybe even have a couple of echelons beneath them, so you might have a manager and she is over three or four supervisors. If you have directors, junior VPs, if you have people at the beginning leadership ranks, the mid-level, the more senior level, uh, we can put together a tailored curriculum for that group. Uh, I can spend some time familiarizing myself with the particulars of the company, of the industry, but, but only to help tease out that, again, very core material that helps those leaders be more resonant with their team members. Uh, because the people in the audience aren't necessarily the ones who say, yeah, uh, come speak to us. It's typically their boss or their boss's boss. Yeah. Uh, my track record has typically been uh, if I'm conversing with somebody who is over some sort of an organizational pyramid and they've got a couple of echelons beneath them, that's a great person for me to talk to. Because uh, if he or she believes in uh, what it is that I do and how I can help, that person is in a position to then lend his or her credibility to the organization, uh, the echelons that he or she wants in the classroom. Uh, you know, if, if I walk up to a frontline supervisor at a small company or uh, Microsoft, uh, he or she can't say, oh, yeah, come on in next Tuesday and uh, I'll, I'll gather 30 or 40 of my closest friends. Uh, no, it needs to be somebody who is an owner, who is um, in the C-suite, maybe a senior vice president, a, a general manager, somebody with other leaders under him or her. Okay. What do those metrics look like? Uh, I've hired you, you've come in, you've um, spoke to my people, you, you've helped develop some of my leaders, potential leaders and so forth. What does that look like on the back end? What can, can a company expect to see as a result of your consulting services? Yeah, so uh, there are any number of quantifiable data sets out there that in a sales pitch, I could tell somebody that, look, it has been demonstrated empirically that there is a 19.3% decrease in turnover uh, if you hire me. Uh, I you got to believe as a guy that lived and died by numbers as an Air Force pilot, yeah. uh, I'm all about metrics, right? Yeah. At the same time, uh, I, I'm, I'm careful to paint an explicit picture for somebody. Rather, uh, because there's some degree of just in intrinsic understanding. I think most people would implicitly understand that if my leaders are more effective, if my leaders are more resonant with their teams, I am less likely to have uh, higher turnover. They are more likely to be productive. There's, there's ample uh, case studies and uh, fairly detailed research which indicates, I think pretty clearly, that the person to whom you report has the biggest impact on your job satisfaction. Now, there's exceptions. Mm -hmm. In any data collection set, you'll have standard deviations left and right. But more often than not, most people, if you ask them, do you like where you work?, they won't get very far into that answer before they reference uh, their boss, mm. their manager, their supervisor, their commander, their captain, their chief. Nobody has a bigger impact on how you feel about your job than the person who gives you direction, who gives you feedback, who stamps your time card. And so uh, what we you know, really encourage people to think about is that, again, in an era, no, I shouldn't say that. Budgets have always been tight. There's been a few, maybe the roaring 20s, you know, pre-2008 when, you know, companies were a little more flush with cash. Uh, but, but money, as important as it is, is probably second to time. You know, giving up people for two hours to two days, that, that's a significant investment. But it's also one that communicates to those people, taking it back to where I began, I value you as a person. Like, we are investing in your growth and development. And somebody who is in a better heightened, emotionally intelligent leadership state is much more likely to be resonant with their teams, to be inspirational, to be influential, to create an environment, to foster a culture in which the employees are happier, less likely to quit, and more likely to give you their very best. Yeah, be more productive, less likely, yeah, less uh, likelihood of time theft or even theft if you have inventory, that kind of kind of thing. Um, that's a great answer. You, you mentioned valuing your team members. 
what values do you bring to the table that help guide in, you know your your your, um, your consulting that you offer people? Um, we've talked about you know the the specifics of okay, I can work on this. I can look at it from a psychological standpoint, a neurological standpoint, leadership, all that. Can you talk about your personal values? I'm sure that they play a big role in how you um, how you navigate life and how you help your clients. Uh, Yes, uh, most assuredly. And, and I would also, um, with all humility, uh, tell you that uh, my values are aspirational and they are goals to which I routinely fail. Okay. Right? <laughs> so one of the things I tell uh, my children, and children becomes a different word when they're in their 20s, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I guess they're always your kids, right? You can't force them at that point, right? <laughs> no, you can, you can bribe them, uh, yeah. you can threaten them, but it loses its potency yeah. uh, once they have car keys and a driver's license that says they're a legal adult. Yeah. Um, so I have, have always encouraged them that uh, we are blessed to live in America. Agreed. Whereby if you have a eighth grade education, but invent a longer lasting light bulb. You live in a society that will reward that. Yeah. That, you know, we, we hit the lottery simply being born here. And so we're fortunate in that in large measure, though people will struggle throughout life financially from time to time. If you're familiar with that Maslow hierarchy of needs, sure. in yeah. many ways, most of our tier one needs can be met relatively straightforward. There are people that struggle with shelter, with food security. I'm, I'm not dismissing that. Right. But accomplished professionals aren't usually worried about having to sleep outside that night. Mm -hmm. Now, they might be worried, quote unquote, uh, about only living in a 3,500 square foot house when right. my cubicle mate has a 4,000 square foot house. Okay. Which is uh, a palace by global standards. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. The, the temples to our own grandeur, yeah. are a very American phenomenon. So I, I've always encouraged the kids that when it comes to choosing a profession, whether you are a W-2 employee, whether you are a serial entrepreneur, uh, are the three Ps, potential, passion, purpose. I like that. A, do you have potential? It is not my place to tell you that you can't be a rock star or uh, an artist or a mason or whatever you are seeking to do, but... But if you have potential, um, you're likely to probably find some success. But even more important than that potential, are you passionate about it? Is it something that you would do for free? If mm -hmm. you hit the Powerball, would you do that job? Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, then there's your answer if you have passion or not. And then finally, purpose. Um, we live in a curated Facebook TikTok world. Look at my manicured nails as I've got my <laughs> feet propped up on the beach with a Mai Tai in my hand and a beautiful sunset. Don't I have it all? Uh, look at my $400,000 car. Look at my $30,000 watch. You know, we certainly live in a time when, though we have not invented largesse in this century, it's always been around. I mean, Roman emperors had no problem showcasing their treasure, right? But now we've kind of democratized the ability to show people what we got. Uh, that has its own reward in the moment, but if it has a purpose, if there is something that altruistically motivates you, if there is something that you look at and think, if the world doesn't remember my name, they will know I was here because I've left a legacy because I poured into something with purpose. You line up your potential, your passion, your purpose, and that is a life well lived. It doesn't mean that there won't be setbacks and shortcomings, and there will be times when you're thinking, I could have been much more successful in X, Y, or Z endeavor, materialistically speaking. And you'll think, maybe I should have done that because I see that they go on vacation all the time and they got a big house and their kids are all going to Ivy League schools and they're writing a check for the tuition. But then when you stop and you pull back and you think, okay, is what I'm doing important in its own right? Is what I'm doing something that is a noble calling? You line those three things up and, and you will have spent the um, the talent that you've been blessed with, I think, wisely. Uh, I've, I've strayed from that at times. I, I, too, have fallen into the keeping up with the Joneses' traps. Mm. I, I freely admit it. It's a little voice in my head that's always sure. saying, you know, more, more, more. Um, I bring that same approach to this. Um, I have had jobs that I took because it kept the lights on, put money in the bank, and there was a great 401k match. 
and I don't apologize for that. But um, at this stage of my life, I already told you about the Powerball. I'm not a lottery player, but if I picked up a winning ticket on the ground, I would keep doing this because I, I genuinely believe that the missing ingredient in so many organizations is effective leadership that sometimes the management administratively, bureaucratically, logistically, operationally is sound, but there's like something, something missing. There's something that is not quite yet there. If we don't overcomplicate it and remind ourselves that people leading people is as old as humanity itself, and we approach it as such, yeah. uh, organizations, and more importantly, the people within it tend to um, feel more value in what they do and feel better about how they do it. I like that. I like the PPP, uh, potential, passion, and purpose. Yeah, I'll have to. I'll, I'll remember that one and use that if I have permission to. Obviously, hopefully, <laughs> sure. it's not, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, it's not trademark. The first time you use it, give me credit. After that, it's yours. Okay, yeah. one time use. I like that. You know, it, it it occurred to me when you were talking about your values um, that you enjoy not only leading and working hard, but also connecting with people. Right. In so doing, does do you learn more about yourself when you, when you go and help somebody become a better better leader, be more productive? Be more inspiring. Did you learn something about yourself? You know, yeah. Uh, so for years and years and years and years, um, I wore a fire resistant green olive drab Nomex flight suit. Okay. You know, that was my uniform. And I'm not sure when I had the epiphany, but at one point I realized, you know, there's a fine line between a uniform and a costume. And sometimes by necessity, uh, especially as leaders, um, we get into character. Uh, we take on a role and we sort of act our way through certain circumstances. And, and, and again, sometimes style is all you got left, right? So I'm not apologizing for use and, okay, I don't feel this way, but I'm going to shift into a certain gear. I, I get it. Um, but what I have found when you create as a leader a culture of transparency and openness without sacrificing your integrity, without trying to be everybody's you know big brother or big sister – I can't tell you how many times people would come into my office, you know, so outside my door is a big sign that says commander. It, it was there before I got there. It's probably still there today. And as they're about to knock, whatever they are bringing in that door is the most important issue to them. I'm oblivious to it. They come in and I cannot express to you how many times you could just see the weight of whatever it was on their shoulder. And they, unload with something that is not work-related. It's relatively personal. It might have to do with their kids, something that they're going through themselves, but it's something that's not wrapped up in what they do, mm -hmm. but it's part of who they are. And it's impacting what they do. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's right. And by the end of the conversation, um, they realize that they were worried that my concern would be well, what does this mean to me as a leader and to you as a producer? When instead, they walk away thinking, okay, I could have been wearing this white suit. I could have been wearing overalls. I could have been wearing anything else. It, it didn't matter to him. Like he, he was relating to me as a person. Like He seems genuinely concerned about what I'm going through. And so you have enough conversations like that, and you realize, man, a lot of people are walking around with issues. You know, who we are at work if we were to draw a pie chart and divide our time is a fraction of who we are as a person. Yeah. And so again, being sensitive to never pry, to never overstep bounds, to never get further ahead um, of where they want to go, but, it, but being open to allowing them to feel you know, free to kind of share. Um, it, it's amazing. Um, how often we can turn a uniform into a costume and get into a character because, well, in the movie, uh, this is how the guy always acted. Uh, well, growing up, I always thought this is how she's supposed to act. And sometimes we role play uh, and usually to our detriment. You can't be walking around having an emotional meltdown in front of your coworkers every time you're upset. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But at the same time, if you as a leader inculcate a culture whereby people feel more like people, less like resources. It's amazing what they will do for you when the time comes to ask. Yeah. 
That's well said. You know, I have two people on my team at my company, and I'm working on different ways to motivate them because every person has their own form of how they'd like to be motivated and recognized and so forth. Um, one thing I was thinking about recently is uh, I get, it gets so focused on what I think I can teach them. I think it's equally as important to realize what I can't teach them. Mm-hmm. And one thing I tell people is I can teach you all the technical skills, all that you need to do the job. I can't teach you to be teachable. You know what I'm saying? Sure. And so when I when, when that occurred to me, I was like, wow, that was a real breakthrough. Don't just focus on teaching. Also identify what you can't teach. And hopefully, right. hopefully that person is teachable in the right areas. And where they're not teachable, it, it doesn't apply to the situation. Can you comment on that? Are there things you can't teach people? We've talked a lot of, uh, well, about what you can yeah. teach. How, how long is your program? Because <laughs> we could be here all day making my list of things I can't do. Okay. Well, maybe top three or four. Yeah, yeah. So, Most um, relevant. Yeah. But, but mentorship mentorship may be the most important thing you do as a leader. If you leave an organization and it collapses, you might be tempted to say, oh gosh, look how important I was. As soon as I backed out of the equation, it all fell apart. No, that is a failure on your part because you obviously did not train up a generation of people that could not only take it and run with it, but make it even better. So I feel like mentorship is maybe the most important thing as a leader that you can, you can do. And so what I would do uh, with uh, folks each year is bring them in and we would catalog their past, their education, their training, their experience, their roles, and figure out what they've done. And then I would ask them, on your last day at work, where do you want to be? What, what job do you want the day you retire? And now with their past cataloged and their future aspirations in focus, we can devise the present, the near term, the short term to kind of bridge those two gaps. Sometimes uh, it was a relatively straight connection between what they've done and where they want to go. Other times, you know, typically uh, progression through the ranks is not a ladder. It's more of a jungle gym. Mm -hmm. There's different ways to get to that destination. Uh, There would be areas where I said, okay, I know exactly three different things. You pick one that you can do that rounds you out in this area to make you successful to compete for and succeed in that job you want. Other times, I would be just plainly honest. Like, I don't have an answer for you there. Let me reach out to other people who might have some insight. Let me reach out to my mentors, and they probably yeah. have some answers. And that does two things. Uh, one, it lets you off the hook of feeling like you got to have all the answers as a leader. Because if you ever get to the point where you think you have to know it all, you are about to sink your ship. But secondly, when somebody comes in and the conversation is all about them, if their time with the boss is only about them and his or her career path, and then when you part ways, there's a gap in what they might do that you're going to fill by reaching out on their behalf to other people, what sort of bond do you think that creates? What sort of, um, I dare say, loyalty do you think that instills? And again, you're doing it altruistically. You're not doing it to manipulate them into some sort of fealty uh, because they suddenly like, oh my gosh, this guy's, you know, my uh, star to hitch the wagon to. Uh, But rather you're doing it because you genuinely want to see them go from where they are and get to where they want to be. You do that and uh, you're going to get a much more engaged workforce because now if you have 15 different conversations and they all have 15 different goals, but you're helping all of them move in that direction, uh, I challenge you to imagine a scenario where they are not more engaged, more productive, more energetic, you know, not when they reach their goal, but tomorrow morning. Yeah. Well said. I have three questions for you. Okay. (laughs) This segment of three questions is brought to you by our nonprofit, See Good to Be Good, which aims to act as a source of hope, motivation, and inspiration to help folks achieve their dreams. We're accepting donations to help fund our needs-based scholarship to help a young person pay for their education in the arts. If you'd like to help us, please let us know. Question number one, why are you successful? I am successful because I am smart enough to know just at times how dumb I am. (laughs) And being able to accurately catalog your strengths and weaknesses, part of that self-awareness we discussed earlier, mm. is critical, especially the higher you get. So uh, I don't say that with false modesty. Uh, I say that with genuine sincerity. Um, 
I don't know at what age you get when you stop asking for advice. Uh, it ain't 49, at least not for me. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you ask why, I'm, I, I would, you know, I'm uncomfortable even saying I'm, you know, successful. But, to the but, extent that you are. That's right. There yeah. you go. Thank you. I, I like that caveat. Um, uh, I have been blessed with uh, better, smarter men and women in my life than myself uh, that I was humble enough to go to and get guidance from. That common theme throughout our whole conversation, self-awareness, right? Yeah. Come hook or crook. <laughs> it took yeah. me a while to get there. <laughs> yeah. Why are you happy? Um, I live in America. I, as of today, am in, in relatively good health uh, with a family who loves me. And whether my business has zero clients or I'm giving keynote speeches at um, international events, um, they loved me before I started this. I think they'll love me afterwards in spite of uh, all my flaws. So at the end of the day, um, happiness is intrinsic and it's not measured by my bank account, my accolades, my resume, or my uh, JV win-loss record. Yeah. Uh, question number three, what obligation do you feel to help other people? Uh, paying it forward. So uh, we are born into this world selfish. You do not need to teach a baby to be selfish. You don't need to somehow convey to them uh, when they lack language. Let me know when your diaper needs changed. Let me know when you're hungry. Let me know when you're tired. Uh, they'll let you know. <laughs> so... The maturation process, I think, at its essence, is about transitioning from a selfish person to a selfless person, and it dovetails coming out of childhood into the workforce and into the leadership ranks, right? You know, you want to be a leader who serves those entrusted to your care, uh, not the whiny baby that needs the world to revolve around him or her, uh, yeah. because we figured out how to do that. Yeah, that that comes honestly. Right? And some people never get past that, right? Yeah, right. that's right. So, um, <clears throat> when I went to pilot training uh, as a newly minted second lieutenant, there was an entire base dedicated to turning me into a pilot. The base gym was there for me. The base bowling alley was there for me. The instructors were there, but that was the student's world. It all existed for the students. Did you realize that at the time? No. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, No. Being empathetic towards those ogres that put me under constant threat of uh, duress (laughs) in that cockpit? No. (laughs) But it's just like you didn't appreciate getting grounded at 10 years old at the time either, right? But you recognize, okay, after a long day at work, and after having told me not to do something, my dad comes home and finds out I did it. Uh, I now, as an adult, realize he wasn't happy about dealing with that situation, but but it was all about me, mm-hmm. modifying my behavior. If he wasn't going to have my loyalty, he would have my obedience, right? So at the time, as a brand new student pilot, you know, that, that two-year whatever process, um, it was all revolving around me. And it, it takes a while, really. I mean, sometimes we're not into our... our earlier mid-20s before we finally start giving back. Kindergarten, that teacher's there for you. Elementary school, they're there for you. That t-ball coach, they're for you. That building that you call the high school, that's there for you. Everything's there for you. Mm -hmm. And then you get to a certain point in life where, okay, if I'm not giving back yet, can I at least break even? Can I at least carry my own weight? Yeah. Then if you are appreciative of the army of people that have helped you get to where you're at in life, yeah, from the aunt that rocked you when you had colic uh, to the teacher that stayed after school to sit in the same detention room as you because of how you were acting. All those people spent time and energy of their own for you. You get to a certain point, I think if you can appreciate that, you realize, okay, I'm not going to be here forever. And I don't know how long the clock is ticking before, you know, the, the buzzer sounds. Yeah. I really need to start trying to like, you know, pay some down, uh, some down of uh, this debt. Uh, you may never get there. I may never get there, uh, but it won't be for lack of effort. Um, yeah. I'm, again, like anybody, I've got selfish tendencies. Uh, I acknowledge that. But when I'm at my best, can I at least make some type of an effort uh, to pay back a world that's been so very good to me? Yeah, well said. Pablo Casals, master cellist, was once asked, why at your age of 90 do you bother practicing three hours a day? His response was, 
Well, I'm beginning to notice some improvement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. I think that speaks to work ethic and self-discipline. Um, if you would like to be a guest on our show or you would like help creating and or distributing your own podcast content, please contact us for more information. I'd like to thank again my guest, Sean Dolly, for being here today. Thank you for having me. Yes, uh, it was a privilege. Uh, you're president of OT2 Consulting. That stands for On Time and On Target. He helps uh, businesses with leadership development and uh, your credentials, both in the military, your academic background, and then your corporate ex experience are um, very impressive. So I encourage anybody listening, if you are a decision maker at a business, you're trying to bring up new leadership, you're trying to make your team more inspired and more profitable, um, contact Sean. He can, I, I firmly believe he can really help you develop those, um, those assets in your company and uh, make your company ultimately a better place to work and more profitable. Um, I'd like to think of... Excuse me. Oh, before I do that, I want to. How can people interact with you? Give us your website. Give us your phone number. Your preferred method of contact. Uh, the best way to get a hold of me is to come to the website ot2consulting.com. That's ot2consulting.com. Perfect. And all of his information will be po posted along with the episode. So if you guys didn't get that, you can uh, look at the show notes and see how to get in contact with Sean, interact with him. I'd like to take a moment to thank myself because without me, none of this would be possible. <laughs> I script and cast the show, host and produce the show and edit and distribute the show online to our eight platforms. So I'd like to thank myself. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank our guest again, Sean, for being here. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today. And I'd like to thank our sponsors for making this podcast possible and hopefully successful. And we will see you real soon on a future episode of the Respect the Math podcast.